Anglo-Saxon art covers art produced within the Anglo-Saxon period of English history, beginning with the migration period style that the Anglo-Saxons brought with them from the continent in the 5th century, and ending in 1066 with the Norman conquest of a large Anglo-Saxon nation-state whose sophisticated art was influential in much of northern Europe. The two periods of outstanding achievement were the 7th and 8th centuries, with the metalwork and jewellery from Sutton who in a series of magnificent illuminated manuscripts, and the final period after about 950, when there was a revival of English culture or after the end of the Viking invasions. By the time of the conquest the move to the Romanesque style is nearly complete. The important artistic centers, insofar as these can be established, were concentrated in the extremities of England, in Northumbria, especially in the early period, and Wessex and Kent near the south coast. Anglo-Saxon art survives mostly in illuminated manuscripts, Anglo-Saxon architecture, a number of very fine ivory carvings, and some works in metal and other materials. Opus Anglicanum was already recognized as the finest embroidery in Europe. Although only a few pieces from the Anglo-Saxon period remain, the Bayer tapestry is a rather different sort of embroidery, on a far larger scale. As in most of Europe at the time, metalwork was the most highly regarded form of art by the Anglo-Saxons. But hardly any survives. There was enormous plundering of Anglo-Saxon churches monasteries and the possessions of the dispossessed nobility by the Norman rulers in the first decades, as well as the Norsemen before them, and the English Reformation after them, and most survivals were once on the continent. Anglo-Saxon taste favoured brightness and colour, and an effort of the imagination is often needed to see the excavated and worn remains that survive as they once were. Perhaps the best-known piece of Anglo-Saxon art is the Bayer Tapestry which was commissioned by a Norman patron from English artists working in the traditional Anglo-Saxon style. Anglo-Saxon artists also worked in fresco, stone, ivory and whalebone, metalwork, glass and enamel, many examples of which have been recovered through archaeological excavation and some of which have simply been preserved over the centuries, especially in churches on the continent, as the Vikings. Normans and Reformation iconoclasm between them left virtually nothing in England except for books and archaeological finds. Overview Metalwork is almost the only form in which the earliest Anglo-Saxon art has survived, mostly in Germanic-style jewellery which was, before the Christianization of Anglo-Saxon England, commonly placed in burials. After the conversion, which took most of the 7th century, the fusion of Germanic Anglo-Saxon, Celtic and late antique techniques and motifs, together with the requirement for books, created Hiberna Saxon style, or insular art, which is also seen in illuminated manuscripts and some carved stone and ivory, probably mostly drawing from decorative metalwork motifs and with further influences from the British Celts of the West and the Franks. The Kingdom of Northumbria in the far north of England was the crucible of insular style in Britain, at centres such as Lindisfarne, founded c. 635 as an offshoot of the Irish monastery on Iona, and Monk Wermuth, Jarrow Abbey which looked to the continent. At about the same time as the insular Lindisfarne Gospels was being made in the early 8th century, the Vespasian Psalter from Canterbury in the far south which the missionaries from Rome had made their headquarters, shows a wholly different, classically based art. These two styles mixed and developed together and by the following century the resulting Anglo-Saxon style had reached maturity. However Anglo-Saxon society was massively disrupted in the 9th century, especially the later half, by the Viking invasions and the number of significant objects surviving falls considerably, and their dating becomes even vaguer than of those from a century before. Most monasteries in the north were closed for decades, if not forever, and after the Canterbury Bible of before 850, perhaps well before, no major illuminated manuscript is known until well on into the 10th century. 
King Alfred held the Vikings back to a line running diagonally across the middle of England, above which they settled in the Danelaw, and were gradually integrated into what was now a unified Anglo-Saxon kingdom. The final phase of Anglo-Saxon art is known as the Winchester School or style, though it was produced in many centres in the south of England, and perhaps the Midlands also. Elements of this begin to be seen from around 900, but the first major manuscripts only appear around the 930s. The style combined influences from the continental art of the Holy Roman Empire with elements of older English art and some particular elements including a nervous agitated style of drapery, sometimes matched by figures, especially in line drawings, which are the only images in many manuscripts, and were to remain especially prominent in medieval English art. Illuminated Manuscripts Early Anglo-Saxon manuscript illumination forms part of insular art, a combination of influences from Mediterranean. Celtic and Germanic styles that arose when the Anglo-Saxons encountered Irish missionary activity in Northumbria, at Lindisfarne and Iona in particular. At the same time the Gregorian mission from Rome and its successes imported continental manuscripts like the Italian Street, Augustan Gospels, and for a considerable period the two styles appear mixed in a variety of proportions in Anglo-Saxon manuscripts. In the Lindisfarne Gospels, of around 700 to 715, there are carpet pages and insular initials of unprecedented complexity and sophistication. But the evangelist portraits, clearly following Italian models, greatly simplify them, misunderstand some details of the setting, and give them a border with interlace corners. The portrait of St. Matthew is based on the same Italian model, or one extremely similar, used for the figure of Ezra that is one of the two large miniatures in the Codex Amiatinus. But the style there is very different, a far more illusionistic treatment, and an attempt to introduce a pure Mediterranean style into Anglo-Saxon England, which failed, as perhaps too advanced, leaving these images apparently as the only evidence. A different mixture is seen in the opening from the Stockholm Codex Aureus where the evangelist portrait to the left is in a consistent adaptation of Italian style, probably closely following some lost model, though adding interlace to the chair frame, while the text page to the right is mainly in insular style, especially in the first line, with its vigorous Celtic spirals and interlace. The following lines revert to a quieter style more typical of Frankish manuscripts of the period, yet the same artist almost certainly produced both pages, and is very confident in both styles. The evangelist portrait of John includes roundels with Celtic spiral decoration probably drawn from the enamel discussions of hanging bowls. This is one of the so-called Tiberius group of manuscripts, which lent towards the Italian style and appear to be associated with Kent, or perhaps the Kingdom of Mercia in the heyday of the Mercian supremacy. It is, in the usual chronology, the last English manuscript in which developed trumpet spiral patterns are found. The 9th century, especially the latter half, has very few major survivals made in England, but was a period when insular and Anglo-Saxon influence on Carolingian manuscripts was at its height, from scriptoria such as those at the Anglo-Saxon Missions Foundation at Ecton Ash Abbey, and the major monastery at Tours where Alcuin of York was followed by another Anglo-Saxon abbot, between them covering the period from 796 to 834. Although Tor's own library was destroyed by Norsemen, over 69th century illuminated manuscripts from the scriptorium survive in a style showing many borrowings from English models, especially in initial pages where insular influence remained visible in northern France until of in the 12th century. The Anglo-Saxon metalwork produced in the Salzburg area of modern Austria has a manuscript counterpart in their cut birched gospels in Vienna. By the 10th century insular elements were relegated to decorative embellishments in England, as the first phase of the Winchester style developed. 
The first plant ornament, with leaves and grapes, was already seen in an initial in the Leningrad bead, which can probably be dated to 746. The other large initial in the manuscript is the first historiated initial in the whole of Europe. The classically derived vine or plant scroll was to largely oust interlace as the dominant filler of ornamental spaces in Anglo-Saxon art just as it did in much of Europe beginning with Carolingian art, though in England animals within the scrolls remained much more common than abroad. For some long-time scrolls, especially in metal, bone or ivory, are prone to have an animal head at one end and a plant element at the other. All these changes were not restricted to manuscripts, and may not have been driven by manuscript style. But we have a greater number of manuscripts surviving than works in other media. Even if in most cases illuminations are restricted to initials and perhaps a few miniatures, several ambitious projects of illumination are unfinished, such as the Old English Hexatuch, which has some 550 scenes in various stages of completion, giving insight into working methods. The illustrations give Old Testament scenes an entirely contemporary setting and are valuable images of Anglo-Saxon life. Manuscripts from the Winchester School or style only survived from about the 930s onwards. This coincided with a wave of revival and reform within English monasticism. Encouraged by King Ethelstan and his successors, Ethelstan promoted Dunstan, a practicing illuminator, eventually to Archbishop of Canterbury, and also Ethelwold and the French-trained Norseman Oswald. Illumination in a new style appears in a manuscript of the biographies by Bede of St. Cuthbert given by Ethelston to the monastery in Chesterlow Street about 937. There is a dedication portrait of the king presenting his book to the saint, the two of them standing outside a large church. This is the first real portrait of an English king, and heavily influenced by Carolingian style, with an elegant and habited acanthus border. However the initials in the text combine Carolingian elements with animal forms in inventive fashion. Miniatures added in England to the continental Ethelston Psalter begin to show Anglo-Saxon liveliness in figure drawing in compositions derived from Carolingian and Byzantine models. And over the following decades the distinctive Winchester style with agitated draperies and elaborate acanthus borders develops. The Benedictional of St. Ethelwold is a masterpiece of the later Winchester style, which drew on insular, Carolingian, and Byzantine art to make a heavier and more grandiose style, where the broad classicizing acanthus foliage sometimes seems over-luxuriant. Anglo-Saxon illustration included many lively pen drawings, on which the Carolingian Utrecht Psalter, in Canterbury from about 1000, was highly influential. The Harley Psalter is a copy of it. Anglo-Saxon culture was coming into increasing contact with, and exchanging influences with, a wider Latin medieval Europe. Anglo-Saxon drawing had a great influence in northern France throughout the 11th century, in the so-called Channel School, and insular decorative elements such as interlace remained popular into the 12th century in the Franco-Saxon style. The Incipit to Matthew from the Book of Lindisfarne, an insular masterpiece. David from the Durham Cassiodorus, a rare non-liturgical illuminated manuscript from the early period. The Baptism of Christ from the Benedictional of St. Ethel Wold, 970s. In this illustration from page 46 of the Cadman manuscript, an angel is shown guarding the gates of paradise. After Adam and Eve have been expelled, 